Let me open up in prayer real quick. Father God, I thank you and I praise you for this day and this time, Lord. I For this opportunity, I pray, Lord, that you would take this message that's prepared, God, and you would speak the message that you have, Lord God, that you would guide my mind and my mouth, Lord, and that this would be a edifying and blessing message for us. Does anybody or have you ever had one particular room in your house, maybe your attic or your bedroom or one of your kids' bedrooms or the garage, or it could even be your car, that was, it just got to a point of a mess that was so bad that just walking in that room was overwhelming and you didn't know what to do about it to, to a point where you didn't even want to clean it. You just want to close the door and walk away. Has anybody gotten that feeling looking at the state of, of the government and the country and the direction that it seems to be going in? Have you, have, it's, it's an honest perception that I could, I could definitely identify and understand why somebody would, would get that feeling that everything is going in such a way that it's getting so bad, how, how could we even begin to correct it, to clean it up? And when you get into that kind of situation, you know, there are a fair number of people that are to a point now where they don't even want to try and clean it up. They'd rather just not get involved, right? There's a fair number of people even within the church that doesn't want to get involved. They'll tell you that we don't, our, our position isn't to be involved in politics, that we should be completely separated from it. And even to the point of where we're coming, approaching elections to where they decide that they can't cast a vote and they'll write in, you know, the, you've seen in the past where people have wrote Jesus on the ballot and voted for Jesus. Because they see the, the mess that we're in and they don't know how to clean it up and they don't want to engage in it, they, so they withdraw. Now I would tell you, that I believe that that's not the position the church, the church should take. The church has a position in politics. Not as we spoke in the last couple of weeks. You know, we talked that not to be in allegiance and taking our position as a, into a party over our position in the church, but to have an understanding, as we covered, that the church, when it finds itself in unity... And when it builds its relationship with Christ, then it can find its true position in the church. And so that's what we, we, you know, we talked about the elephant, we talked about the donkey. So now, these, these last messages on, on this series, we're going to give it a, a biblical perspective, right? So the, the first party, and unlike the partisan parties that we deal with in our normal realm... You know, like I said, this is a church of unity, so they actually work together. And the first one being is represented as the lion. So that would be, you know, the lion has always traditionally been a symbol of conquer, conquest. You know, the, the lion hearts of the British Empire, and the lion has always been a symbol of, you know, triumphant conquering. And, and that's what, what we're going to talk about. You know, we as believers... We're, we're not meant to shrink back like Andy talked about last week. We're meant to get in, not to be of, but to be in the culture and to be a part of it. And God has given us, it in the book of Genesis, right out of the gate, he has given us a responsibility to be stewards of the creation that he has made. So that is a function that we, sh we should fulfill, that we are to be stewards in whatever capacity of whatever place that we find ourselves in. And this has been a struggle that, you know, believers of God have, have struggled, you know, all the way through time as we went through a little bit last week with the repetition trends of, of the Jewish people where they would believe and they would have good, prosperous times and then they would fall off and 
not believe. Like, what is that? You've probably seen that meme where, what is it? Strong men create good times. Good times create, oh, what is it? Hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. And good times create weak men. Weak men create bad times. And the cycle perpetuates. So, you know, in 1947, post-World War II, there's a theologian named Carl Henry. And at that time, he warned the people, that his contemporaries at the time, that they were in risk of Christianity losing its cultural influence. Because at that time, many evangelicals were tempted to withdraw and had already withdrawn from the public square, from the public argument, and had become inadequate at applying the gospel message to the social problems that were there at the time. And as he rightly put his finger on it, you know, withdrawing in that way, it sent a signal that the Christianity could not compete with other ideologies, that other ideologies answered questions better than Christianity did. And yes, they don't. We know they don't. We know the answers that we find in the scriptures and the direction from God is the, the ultimate answer for everything. But the believer's lack of engaging that sent a message out to the people. And it was, thankfully, you know, there was a time like this great spiritual awakening where it, there was a comeback and the church had re-engaged. And now we see that cycle going in where it's starting to fall off a little bit. But, you know, that's, that's what we have to be, be on top of, that in government politics, this, that sphere is part of our life. It, one of the points last week Andy made, he talked about how, you know, he had the boxes, and he says how many people put their religion box away, and they pull that political box out once every four years. And I thought, I was thinking about that this week, and it's true probably for a majority of people, but really, it's something that we should be engaged in every day. Like, politics shouldn't be a once every four years thing. It should be an everyday thing. It should be something that we always are involved in. Not just because the presidential elections aren't the only thing that matter, because there's local elections and there's state elections, and all those are important too, but to really get a feel and understanding for it, we have to look at the word politics and what it actually means. So the word politics roots from a Greek word, which is polis. And that word was referred to Greek city-states, okay, which were you know, political entities ruled by bodies of citizens within the empire. And what the polis did was it dealt with all activities and all affairs of the city-state, you know, politics, so politics properly understood is a total study of man, society, state, mor morality, and how people organize such things. So, when we look at it in that sense, politics is intimately connected with the community. It's how we relate other people to each other, and it, it is inseparable from the concept of loving one's neighbors. So, if we convince ourselves that politics only deal with narrow subsets of the party lines and it only deals with narrow times of years where there's certain specific big elections and we choose to withdraw from politics at large, society and our neighbors will all be worse off for it. So the, the, the question that was posed is, should we be concerned or involved in politics? And the answer is absolutely yes. And there is biblical examples from Genesis all the way through Revelations that we could go to, or Revelation, sorry, that we could go to and, def, you know, get what God's plan for us from a conquering perspective when it comes to engaging government. So, you, like, early on in Genesis, God sets up governmental systems. He sets up structures where he has rules and he has what they're supposed to do if those rules are broken the basic constructs of a governmental system, you know, rules that we live by. So we could go from there, and then we could go into so many other examples that, that God has given us through, through the time 
like Joseph. You know, many of us are familiar with Joseph. He was plucked out of his family, sold by his brothers to Egypt. So he was in a foreign land, completely separated from everything he knew. And what did he do? He prospered. He worked diligently in the house as a slave. He became second in command of all of Egypt by the end of it. To the point where he was able to bring his family in in a time of crisis and keep them safe. And then the Jewish people were prospered in Egypt for, for a time. And you have Esther. You know, it wasn't a couple weeks ago, I think we went through the Esther story. And you see how, again, she was out of an element where she was. She was a low, you know, common Jew. Ended up becoming the queen. You know, and then you see Mordecai as well in that story and how he was involved and his character put him in a position where he was able to positively affect the culture around him. And you see the ebbs and flows of, of time, you know, and, and the Jewish people and you see, you know, the, the crucial time where they get completely wiped out by, by Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar comes in and lays them low. And they were exiled for 70 years, right? So this is where we're, we're going to look at a word that Jeremiah wrote to lead us into the main point. To the people that were in exile, okay, this is the position that God gave Jeremiah to send to the people in exile in Babylon. In Jeremiah 29, he says, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Now this is the key verse here. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray for the Lord of it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. So you see the position that God gave the message to Jeremiah to give to all the people that were in exile. You know, he tells them to live their life, to take care of their families, to prosper. But then he also tells them that it is their responsibility to seek the prosperity of the new place that they are in. It was their responsibility as exiles to seek the prosperity of the Babylonian Empire at that time. And to pray for the king. Right? Which leads us to one of the uh, very prominent prophets during the exile time, Daniel. <clears throat> we could read through the book of Daniel and you could mine a lot of a lot of good application to, the, to this subject, but I, I whittled it down to just three main points. And it starts right out of the gate in the first chapter. So, you know, we, we know the story. Daniel was among others who Nebuchadnezzar went in and plucked them out of, of Israel before Israel was completely wiped off the map. And brought them in and taught them for three years the ways of the Babylonians. Educated them for three years. And then at the end of those three years, they were all measured. And you know, the ones that Nebuchadnezzar found approval of, he brought into his, his house to work. Amongst the other magicians and wise men and, and the like from other Places that he has conquered. So, right out of the gate, we see the very first point. Whenever we are engaging with, with our country, whenever we're engaging in the, in the political realm, you know, rightly understood, not just the political extremes that we talked about, the very first thing that we have to remember, if we're going to be conquerors for Christ, is that we cannot compromise our standards. 
Very first thing. All right, so Daniel was brought in, and, and him and three of his friends, you know, they make, the, they make the cut, they make the grade. And here in the first chapter, it says, Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, <clears throat> and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. Daniel was to be Belteshazzar. Hananiah was Shadrach, Mishael was Meshach, and Azariah was Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. So right out of the gate, we see that Daniel, as he finds himself in this new situation, you know, he had an option. He wasn't the only Jewish person that was there. Him and his three friends weren't the only Jewish people that were there. But they are the only four that we see in Scripture that made a resolution that they weren't going to compromise what God told them was right. They weren't going to take the food and the wine that the king was offering them. Most likely was food that they were not permitted to be eaten through the law that was given to them in Leviticus. So they made no hesitation in saying, putting their foot down and saying, we're not going to compromise on what God has told us is right. And, and that is a very physical application because it was, they had legitimate food laws that they followed. But for us, we can abstract out from that you know, to a, a very important principle that we can live by, which is you are what you eat, right? So physically, yes, you are what you eat. But mentally, spiritually, also, we are what we eat. We know, from, you know, as we study Scripture and we grow a relationship with God, we know what God tells us is healthy for us, what is beneficial for us, and how we can prosper in our lives. And if we choose not to do that, we suffer for it. You know, like we could... You know, just like eating food, like I, I could come to church once a week, right? It'd be like going to a gym. And I can go to a gym once a week and work out, but if every day of the week after that, I'm getting McDonald's for breakfast, I'm getting Dunkin' Donuts for breakfast, I'm getting McDonald's for lunch, and then I'm going and hitting up the China Buffet for dinner and rounding it off with some little Debbie's at bedtime or something, What's that one day at the gym really going to do, right? It'll make me feel good that day that I work out, but it's not going to do anything to help me get stronger and healthier. And it's the same way, you know, spiritually. If, if we come to church once a week or we engage in devotions once a week or we pray once a week or sparingly at best, how is that going to make us stronger and more fit? You know, we, we, we have the plan, so it's like me calling up a, a you know, a dietitian and getting a, a plan on how I can eat healthy and do all of that, and then calling up a physical trainer and getting a whole routine on exercise, and then every day I sit down and read that, right? How does that help? But at the same time... You know, again, spirit, spiritually speaking, instead of growing our, our faith and growing our knowledge in Scripture and prayer, you know, what are, we, what are we consuming in terms of social media, in terms of music, movies, um, conversations with people outside our church family, like coworkers, you know, what types of jokes are we engaging in and laughing at like all these things these like you know i always teach my kids you know listening to music pay attention to the lyrics because nobody pays attention not nobody but many people don't pay attention to lyrics they say oh i like the beat i like the sound of it it's really good and i always tell them whether you know it or not you're receiving a message there's a message in every song and if you don't know what you're receiving that doesn't mean you're not getting it and anything that you put in is going to come out. Just like anything you put in physically, you know, it's going to come out. <laughs> but, but Daniel, 
He did not compromise. Many others did. It was just him and his four friends. They refused to compromise. Now, point number two, as we go further into Daniel, you know, God, I, I, honestly, I believe that everybody, everybody across the, the globe has natural gifts. We have natural inclinations, things that we are just good at. Some is leadership, some may be singing or cooking or encouragement. So I think everybody has natural gifts, but as the Bible teaches us, you know, when we put our faith in Christ and we, we give our life to the Lord, God grants us, he gifts us another gift, right? A spiritual gift, a spiritual strength. And in order to be conquerors, we have to engage those gifts. Because I think every gift has an antithesis to it. You know, like if you're an encourager, I believe that you have the ability to really destroy somebody's self-esteem if it's on that, that negative side of it, right? If you're a good, strong leader, you have the ability to lead people right, or you can lead them way down the wrong path. So we have natural gifts, and we have spiritual gifts, and as we engage our culture, you know, we, we have to use the gifts that God has given us to be faithful witnesses, not just for personal gain, and not just when times when it's good, and, you know, but all the time. And we see this in Daniel, right, in the second chapter, you know, 17, I'll start at verse 17. Daniel returned to his house and explained the matter to his friends. Oh, let me give you a little backstory. Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? And he, did, he didn't know what to make of the dream, so he called all of his wise men in and all of his magicians, and he told them he wanted to know the interpretation of the dream, but he refused to tell them what the dream was. And he told them if they could not give him the dream and then interpret it, then he was going to kill every wise man and magician and Chaldean that was in the empire. Okay, so that's, and their response was, there's no way that's possible. Nobody can tell you what your dream was, only the gods would know that, and they don't dwell amongst man. So let's fast forward now to verse 17, and Daniel catches wind of this as one of the king's appointees comes to gather up him and his friends to kill off all the wise men, and Daniel returns to the house. And he explains the matter to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He urges them to plead for mercy from God of heaven concerning this mystery so that he and his friends might not be executed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. During the night, the mystery was re revealed to Daniel and in visions. And then Daniel praised God of heaven and said, Praise be to the name of, of God forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He sets up kings and deposes them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness, and light dwells with him. I thank and praise you, O God of my Father. You have given me wisdom and power. You have made known to me what we ask of you. You have made known to us the dream of the king. Then Daniel went to Arioch whom the king had appointed to execute the wise men of Babylon, and said to him, Do not execute the wise men of Babylon. Take me to the king, and I will interpret his dream for him. Okay, so th that's the text. And going from there, Daniel does go to the king, and he interprets to him this vision that he had, which was not an easy message to deliver for sure, because he was basically telling him that his empire was going to fall, and then the, the ones that were going to come after that. So that's not an easy message to deliver to a king. A king doesn't want to hear that his empire is going to fall. But this is the point that really jumped out to me in this passage that I think I kind of brushed off most times I've read through this until looking at it from this perspective. You know, Daniel was in an interesting position here. All the wise men of Babylon were marked to be executed. Because nobody could give this message. And then Daniel receives the vision to be able to interpret it. Now remember, Daniel and his three friends, you know, they're Jews. They're in a pagan land that worships pagan gods. But at, by this point, they've, they've, 
made a little name for themselves, right? They've got a little, a little pull. So Daniel really had an opportunity here. He could have went to this gentleman that came and was going to take them to execute them all. And he could have said, look, I can answer this question for the king. And I will, as long as you spare me and my three friends. Right, that was, and that would have been a fair position for him to be in, looking at, or even just me and the other people that you've taken from, from Israel. But that isn't what he said here. He says, tell the king that I, that I can tell him. But he says to him, do not execute the wise men of Babylon. So he stood up for all of the wise men of the empire, all of the people that were diviners and magicians and you know, following after the, the pagan gods, which they did not, you know, they did not condone idol worship of that capacity. So he had a good opportunity where he could have been like, you know, keep me and my, my people safe, the rest of them you can execute, and I'll give the king the answer he wants. But he didn't do that. He stood up for the people in the land that he was in. And he, and he does this, you know, he uses this gift through the next, Three or, three or four chapters where he tells Nebuchadnezzar again a, a terrible vision that he's going to end up like a wild beast and he's going to lose his empire for a time and you know messages that are hard to give but there are messages that had to be given and that's, a, that's a, another a point for us you know like we have a message that God has given us to give to everybody and it's not an easy one to give sometimes. More, more times than not, it's not easy to express to strangers, let alone to our close loved ones, that the life that they're living is going to lead them on a path where they're going to end up going up against the Almighty God's wrath at the end of it. You know, that's not an easy message to deliver. But that's the responsibility that we have. And we have the ability... To be that witness through whatever our gift is, whatever God has given us, we have the ability to communicate that. So let's go to our, our final point here. So I don't we go over too far, because I mean, as I said, the more I mind this, I was it's like I could, yeah, we could have a whole series on this. But the third point that I'm going to finish on. And being conquerors for Christ in the culture that we're in, in the political realm that we're in, we must come to a point where we are confident enough that we will not waver when hardship does arise. Because Scripture is plain, Jesus was plain to say that at some point in our lives, hardship is going to come. We are going to have to deal with it. We've probably already dealt with it. It doesn't take much to scratch the surface of any person and see that there's something seriously traumatic or devastating that's happened in their lives. And if it hasn't yet, it probably will. That's just the life that we live. That's the disadvantage of the curse of the fall of, of humanity. But we have... You know, Daniel gives us courage here. And not even, Dan, not even just Daniel in here. I'm going to pull two, two separate stories from Daniel together for this. Because his three friends, they do it first, right? In the third chapter, you know, everybody, a lot of people are familiar with, with the uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the fiery furnace story. That's, you know, anybody, especially if you grew up in the church, you know, that, the, all the kids, just the names alone gets the kids excited. You, know, you say Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's fun. So everybody's familiar with this story, right? Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden statue. He tells everybody they're going to bow down to it. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to do it. At which point, he makes another plea to them to bow down, or he's going to throw them in the fiery furnace. It's not all that uncommon from what we deal with today, right? The, the culture at large wants us to bow to, I mean, pick an idol. You can search on the internet, you can find an idol anywhere, right? There's, 
our culture is full of them. Like football, it could be your job, it could be, I mean, it could be your spouse, it could be your, it, it, sadly, it could even be a ministry that becomes an idol. There's idols everywhere, and the culture wants us to bow down to that. The culture wants us in some angles of the culture where I've even seen recently where they are verbally saying that the Christian doesn't have a place in the public sphere. I don't know if anybody has seen that, but I've seen it from a couple different sources in, in recent times where they're telling us that our message and our philosophy, our beliefs don't have a voice in, in, the, in the public sphere and that we should bow down and put our faith to the side for the culture that, that we are currently living in. Just like those three boys had the same decision that they had to make. They were in a crowd of all of the wise men, all of the magicians, you know, all of the other Jewish people, and they all bowed. You know, and peer pressure is a serious thing. You know, we're, we're surrounded by it all the time. So they had all of their other... And Daniel wasn't even present at the time. He was like their leader that they looked up to. So he wasn't there. So they, they had a critical challenge work out, you know, am, am I going to make this stand? And that's what they did. You know, so everybody is familiar with that, that story, but this is, this is the key, the key of that story. A lot of people cut, cut this verse off short, and it's to our detriment, really. You know, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they get pulled up in front of the king, and he, he tells them again, and he tells them to throw them in the furnace, and this, is, this isn't to their, their reaction. They reply to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you, before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. And he will rescue us from your hand, O king. Now that's where most people stop in this story. And this next verse, like th this is where, where we should strive to get in our faith with God. They look the king, the furnace which he has heat, doubled the heat on, and they say, but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of God, of gold, you have set up. Right? So, that a lot of you, you hear that first half a lot. The Lord will deliver us. It's fine. The Lord will deliver you from any of your troubles. But the, the faith and the tenacity that those three boys had to say, but even if he doesn't, even if we have to go through this tribulation or trial, we refuse to bow to the idols that you are telling us we have to. And then we see the same thing in, in the sixth chapter with Daniel. You know, in the, the lines then, the, one of the most popular stories out of Daniel, where it's the same situation, where he's called out, and the thing that's interesting to point out between these, the, the correlation between these two stories is, you know, to, to, to try and give you some, some real courage as, as we face our trials is, I've said it many times, the adversary has no new tricks. And the more that we learn how to identify what his tricks are, the more that we are equipped to... to you know, evade those attacks when they come. So you see, look, look at the similarities in these two stories, right? The, the boys, they're called out. And wh how are they called out? It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, pay no attention to you, O king, neither serve your gold nor worship the image of gold that you have set up. And then in the chapter 6, they say to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decrees you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. Because Daniel, by this point, is like third in command of the empire, and they passed a decree saying you could pray to no, nothing else but to the emperor. And Daniel, knowing this, still resolved that he wasn't going to waver. And he still did his prayers. Three times a day, he went, 
He opened his windows to Jerusalem like he always did, and he prayed. He could have, he could have kept the windows shut, right? He could have hid behind, behind the walls of his house and did his prayers still, but it was against his convictions. It was against his relationship and faith in God. And you see the same accusation that's thrown up at both of them, that they refuse to acknowledge the gods and the, the idol which is put there for them to worship. And it's interesting because if you go to Luke 23, this is basically the same accusation they throw at Jesus. Right? When they drag him into Pilate and they say to him, you know, why, why, why are we here? And I'm just going to paraphrase this. And they say, because this man is disrupting our, our people and he's causing us to not pay taxes and he doesn't adhere to Caesar. He wants to build his own kingdom. Right? It's the same exact accusation. It's, the, it, it's recurring over and over again. We see it's the same thing. Satan doesn't have new tricks. It's always the same old thing. It's, so we can identify that and we can counteract, you know, because we are meant to be conquerors. That's what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that we don't have a spirit of fear, right? Now, why don't we have a spirit of fear? Because we know how it ends. We know, we know what's going to happen when we do leave this planet, right? We know that we have the faith in Jesus, which gives us that new life, that one day we're going to stand in, in the presence of God, and we're going to be, you know, we're going to be glorified at that day. So how can, how can you not be excited about that? How, can that? how does that not give you confidence that you could face any situation, that you could stand up and boldly represent your faith and not curtail it or hide it away and you know, go with the way of the culture, which sadly too many Christian organizations, I'll, I'll put it that way, are starting to do, where we see that they're starting to bend to the culture, and they're starting to make room for things that we have taught and believed in, in the Christian faith for many years, what, you know, in terms of sexual preferences and abortions, and, you know, we see some mainline entities that are starting to make room for that, and they're making announcements saying that we should change, we should change what we believe, like, I don't know about you, but I'm confident that the Bible teaches that the word never changes, right? Not, Jesus even said, not a stroke, not a letter of this is going to be abolished, but he fulfills it, but it doesn't change. We can't just bend it and change it at our whims. So to close, you know, I just I'm just going to close with the words of Paul. All right? In Romans 8, I'm trying to think of how to preface this. You know, as conquerors, as I said, we have an answer. And it's not an answer that we give with pride. Right? And that's another thing you see from Daniel. The, you know, the three boys, Daniel, they didn't pridefully boast about their abilities so it's not that we have an answer that we give with our chests out puffed out saying that we're going to be delivered someday and you need you know this exclusive thing that that we have this salvation that's not how we approach it but we we have a, a gospel message that we are to deliver you know that jesus came he died for our sins and he was resurrected so that we could have a relationship with god and that's, a, that's, that's our number one goal because, you know, the Bible teaches that we are ambassadors, right? We are, just like Daniel, we are sojourners. We are exiles in a foreign land. We have our time here. We have our place here. And we are meant to prosper in this time and place. We are meant to help this time and place we're in to prosper as well through our deeds and through our prayers but we have that, that is our main focus and job, is to take the gospel and to deliver it to, that none shall perish, right? And that's what Paul tells us here. He says, you know, he tells us, he says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? 
Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger of the sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, and that is Jesus Christ the Lord. So, with that and knowing that, he, Paul then tells us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe on the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Let's close. Father God, I thank you and I praise you for, for this message, Lord, for, for your blessings, God, for, for this country that you've given us to live in. I, I thank you and I praise you, Father God, for, for this time that it is unparalleled in history where we, we have the freedoms that we have, God, and, and you've, you've put us here and you have a purpose for us, God. So I pray, I pray, Lord, for the everyone that has their faith in Jesus Christ, that, God, you would give us direction on how we can engage our culture, how we can engage the, the politic that we are in, Lord, that how we can be a positive influence to our coworkers and our family members and to strangers and, and just be stewards and ambassadors for you, Lord God. And for anybody here, Lord, that that maybe hasn't put their faith in, in Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord God, that, that you would touch them, God, that you would soften their hearts and, and Lord, to just open up their eyes and their spirits, God, that they, that they would see the glory that is in Jesus Christ. Amen.